like you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Ephesians in chapter 5. This is Valentine's week, and so I want to speak to you about marital fulfillment. Very big issue, right? I've heard it said in the streets, and Job echoes the sentiment, man's days are few and full of sorrows as the sparks fly upward. Being mindful of that. If a person is a female or a male, we all can look at this world and say, life is hard. And what has happened in our generation is that we have gotten to the place where we have been told over and over again that we should be happy. You deserve to be happy. It's interesting because this is the catalyst for the breakdown of the home because your mate cannot make you happy. I know a man who can. (laughs) Okay, Lord Jesus can make you happy, but only if you're obedient to him. And so I want you to know that when you get in this generation and you look around and you're thinking, where's happiness going to come from? Do not look to your mate. You and the Lord can work that out, but you and your mate have to work out the other side of this thing. This world is nothing but hostile to your success in your marriage. It wants to destroy your marriage. The devil would do everything he could to destroy that marriage. In fact, he's on the foot every single day to destroy you, your happiness, your marriage. And that means that you have to look at it with clear eyes. You can't look at it as if I should be happy, I'm not happy, therefore I'm going to give this thing up. You have to look at it with clear eyes and from a biblical perspective. This morning I want to talk to you about marital fulfillment because I think it's time for us to make a little bit of a 30,000-foot view of this issue. There are localized passages like in Ephesians 5. I will not be there very much. We're going to use it as a place to start, and we will take pieces out of it because it's the book of Ephesians proper that's going to give us our setting for our talk today. Marital fulfillment would be wonderful, wouldn't it? How do you get that? Well, I believe the how-tos usually are the most prolific sermons out there. People love a how-to. Okay, I'm going to give you a how-to. So that's going to mean that I'm going to have to take you more than one place because there's not one place that tells you how to. There's a whole lot of little what to, what to do, but the how-to is what I'm reaching for today. And so when you come to this passage, you probably want to let your eye fall into chapter 5 to verse 18 because it is there that we begin to get the transition of this book in this section, because there's two sections of the book, and many of Paul's epistles are written like this. He'll first of all teach you doctrine, and then he will teach you about your duty. We're in the middle of the duty part in chapter 5, so it's a transition between these two. It's going to go from the larger church to the individual building blocks of the church, which is the family. So this is where the transition takes place. In verse 18, it says, Do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual song singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, I've often said this. You should see it while we're going through it. Speaking is a participle. That's one way you can stir up the Holy Spirit in you. Speaking to one another about God. Not about the weather. It's not about just having a fellowship, how the kids doing, how's the family. No, it's about talking to each other about God. Hey, I read a verse. Did you get something? You know when I told you about apostasy here a moment ago, a verse that was something we were working around on. You talk to each other. <laughs> Speak to one another. It's, it'll stir you up. It's good. So it says speaking to one another. Then it says singing and making melody. So that's another way. Singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. It's not about having a wonderful voice. It's about looking homeward and seeing our Savior and looking forward to our bridegroom coming. And then it says, giving thanks. So count your blessings. And then it says, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. So those participles are all little handles about what you can do to stir the Spirit of God up in you. Be filled with the Spirit doing this. So it's a how-to. little mini-message, okay? But the reason I bring it to you is because it ends with submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. There are many books written today by people who are in the Christian faith who want to take the Bible and squeeze it into a mold of how to have your best day now. They won't use that 
paradigm, but it's sort of the same thing. And they will tell you that when this says submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God, it is talking about husbands need to submit to their wives. Well, that's not what it says after this. It says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. And then it says, husbands, love your wives. It doesn't say husbands, submit to your wives. So let's just put that off the side right away. There's a lot of bad Bible teaching out there being taught. Okay, There's also a biblical paradigm that kind of fits right in here as well. That in the garden when Eve took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they are telling you today in Christian circles, one of the worst offenders because he has a bigger voice to many people is Kirk Cameron. He'll tell you that Adam was standing right there when she took of the tree. And it was his responsibility to stop her and that he failed and it was his fault that she sinned. And that's not true. The Bible says, and she gave to her husband with her. They were the only two people on earth. No matter where he was at that moment, he was still with her because they were the only two here. And that kind of pressing is wrong, especially if you keep reading the passage, it says, because you listen to to your wife, you're going to bring forth fruit from the ground with thorns and thistles and sweat of your brow and all that. It's because he listened to her, not that men aren't supposed to listen to their wife. They're supposed to. It's a helpmate. She's supposed to be in. But what she did was she gave it to him, and we don't get the narrative. We superimpose the narrative. And many times we do it poorly. But with a sanctified imagination, I kind of look at it, and personally I think what happened was she was in tears and brokenness, and maybe he took and ate on purpose quickly to identify with her. Why? Because he loved the girl. Because that's what men do. Even if men are estranged from their wives, they can be, you know, up in a corner of a housetop, as they say. It says it a couple times in the book of Proverbs, that it's better to be in a corner of a housetop than if there's, you know, kind of contention in the house. Just go to your corner. And she, he could be there, and if somebody tried to hurt her, he would die for her. He would jump in front of the bullet for her. He loves her. He doesn't understand her. <laughs> oh, that's so true. Isn't it? It's hard to understand all these differences and unique things. Why is that true? Because God made it that way, so it would be wonderful. And so we're going to talk about that a little further here in a moment. But I want you to know that there's a lot of bad Bible being taught with regard to this relationship thing that you and I have. If you're going to have marital fulfillment that is going to be heaven-centered, I hope I'll be able to bring you into that understanding of how to as we unfold this a little further. So I told you about this whole submit, and I told you it said submitting one another, and I told you what a bad teaching would be is to say that we're supposed to submit to one another as husband and wife. No, The husband is not to submit to the wife. The word submit literally has a meaning, okay? It means to arrange yourself under. And it's like a commander on a battlefield. If you're a major and he's a general, you're not like a private. You're both weighing in. You're both bringing everything you've got to the table to make the greatest impact for your cause. You and I do that together. We, as building blocks called the church, each family is a unit unto itself. And if you have a wife that doesn't go to church or a husband that doesn't go to church, you still can do your part as representing the church. The Bible says if anybody has an unbelieving spouse that they are sanctified by the presence of the believing one. It doesn't mean they're saved. It just means there's, there's a little hedge for them and there's an opportunity for them to hear and see through you. And your job becomes unique in that paradigm because you have a unique calling, and that is to win that spouse, if at all possible. But we're talking today about marital fulfillment in a Christian home where we are assuming both our believers And both are saved and both are of the same mind that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he is king and that we're his bride and that we have something of a calling in our lives that he has placed there. Now, I've showed you submission. Man's job is to love. And it says, love is Christ, love the church. 
You see, the problem of thinking submitting all around is supposed to be men are submitting to women and women to men is it doesn't leave any clarity. In fact, if you look at what I told you about Genesis 3, where it says, because you listen to your wife, you begin to realize there's a need for headship because the woman was deceived, not the man. The Bible says the man knew what he was doing and therefore, wherefore, by one man's sin. So we became more responsible. She was tricked, but he made up his mind to dive under the bus for his wife. The Bible says, and this is why I believe that he knew what he was doing and he was doing it for her. It says in chapter 1 of the book of Romans that he worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. And then he began to change the likeness of the invisible God into the likeness of man and four-footed beast and all that. But you look at it, it's all pretty much something you got to do the aerial view to get. You're not going to read that passage in Romans 1 and find that important point made when you're reading Ephesians 5 or Genesis 3, okay? This is the aerial view. I'm trying to show you from 30,000 foot height that there's something very significant to be had if you're going to have marital fulfillment. So, we're going to look a little higher on the book of Ephesians. Maybe you might need to flip the page, but Ephesians 1, verse 18, if you want to look at that. The Bible says that Paul was praying for the people in the book of Ephesians. And I want to just let you know that the book of Ephesians was probably a book sent to Ephesus first, but it was a cyclical letter. That meant they were to read it and pass it on to other churches. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing he's telling general things that need to be said. He says, I'm praying for you churches, if you will, including ours, that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. And that's what I want you to drill into in your mind. Really get that. God gave a calling to you and me. He says that you might know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Remember the word glory. We'll talk about that much later, but keep it in mind. It's there early on in Ephesus because when you know the hope of his calling, you can begin to answer the call, right? The word church is a Greek word, ekklesia. Ek, like exit, means out. And then klesia is Kaleo, we get the word call from it. You and I have been called out of the world. We have a calling, but there is a hope of this calling. He didn't call you out just to stand out there in the middle of the field with nothing to do. The calling has purpose. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4 of Ephesians. The Bible says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk. So there's your purpose. You're supposed to be walking for the Lord. <laughs> Trust and obey, you know, there's no other way. You've got one foot in front of the other. Trust and obey. It's walking. But here's the thing. It says, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So it's not about your occupation. It's your calling. It's your vocation. The Bible says that you need to do this in chapter 4 until, verse 13... We all come in the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, I've just taken you into the woods, didn't I? You thought, man, that's a lot of prepositions. That's deep words right there. But what he just said is to the churches that are in the cycle, which we're going to read the book of Ephesians, what we're seeing is he's telling them he's, God's got a plan for your life. He's got a calling. His calling on your life is that you might grow up into Jesus. That you might grow up into Christ. And that you might be having full measure of stature, which means squared shoulders and clarity. Okay, you can't have that if you do not know what you're supposed to be doing. Very important. Marital fulfillment demands that you understand your calling. We have a purpose. We have a prayer over us that we will understand our calling. We have a purpose. We have been called. We need to walk worthy of that. And we need to walk trusting and obeying that we might come to the full unity of the faith. Now... If you're talking about building blocks in your family, you as a husband and wife need to be unified. You need to have unity. 
Okay, you, you want to know how to have a marital fulfillment? It's to have unity. If we're talking about the outliers where it's a time where you have to really work it out because one of them's not believing, your job is to just love on that person for Jesus. Just like if Jesus was in your shoes, you love them for Jesus. That's your calling there. But in a marriage where both are confessing Christians, there needs to be unity. Just like there needs to be unity in the body, we think of the church, but there needs to be unity in the home, first and foremost. I mean, how can we really have unity in the body of Christ church-wise if there's disunity in the family where the couple's not on the same page? So he wants you to grow up and have the same mind. He wants you to have the same ideas. He wants you to have unity of the faith. Now, you can't have unity of the faith if you don't believe the same. We've got to believe the same thing about faith, because when you do that, guess what? When you're having a conversation with somebody, you both can weigh in and help. I cite for you Aquila and Priscilla. Apollos didn't have his theology right. Aquila and Priscilla loved him. He was wonderful to listen to, but he didn't quite get where he needed to go. And they took him aside, gave him some tea and cookies, perhaps, and said, Hey, listen, you need to know this. There's more to what you're saying, and I can sense you're coming up short. You don't know where to go with it. And they instructed him further, and he got on his way with a clear gospel. A couple came together and helped that situation. Now, remember them, because that's one of those places where you see a couple working together. I don't know if it's ever surprised you, but when you see Abraham and Sarah, you do not see them taking long strolls on the beach. What do you see? Her name was Sarai, meaning contentious, and his name was Abram, meaning father of many. When she got converted to the promise in her heart and really came across the bar, her name got changed to Sarah, which meant princess, and his name got changed to Abraham, father of multitudes, because once they got together, they became fruitful. She was conniving to get things done in a certain way behind the scenes. She was favoring this one. He was favoring that one. They weren't walking on long walks uh, on the beach. Okay, important to know, because you don't see that kind of a thing in the Bible. What you do see is you see a lot of discord that really is a result of the fall. In the dressing down moments of Genesis chapter 3, when God has taken the woman, the serpent, and had a row with Adam there, he gave them all their curse, what they were going to have to endure. And what it says to the woman is your desire is going to be toward your husband, and he shall rule over you. Interesting, right? Well, there's a gal named Susan Foe. She wrote a book on the desire of woman. And when she wrote the book, she came to this conclusion that there was only a couple of options of what it could mean that her desire would be toward her husband. One of them would be the sensual, sexual desire. And if anybody got cursed with that, it was the man. He's the more aggressive, and that's not something really she takes much stock in. But she puts it there because it's impossible, because it's his desire, and it's marital, and so what is it? So she puts that out there. The other one is, is that she will desire to just please him all the time. That ain't happening. Nobody's like that in a sinful world. We all have sin. So she says, but it has to be said, because some women really pull this thing off in a beautiful way. They do nurture their family. The Bible says that the virtuous woman who's hard to find, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her, and she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. So she's basically got her calling down, and you're looking at a rarity, admittedly, because the Bible says hard to find this woman. So it's not something that's natural for a woman to want to naturally please. The third one is, your desire shall be to your husband. And she says that your desire shall be to your husband means that she's going to desire to overthrow him. She's going to desire to control him. Now, this is probably more of a problem in our generation because we don't have 15, 20 kids. So women have more time. So when the kids get to be a little older, they're not still having babies and still managing the house with every ounce of their being, and they begin to mother the husband. You begin to maybe mother your husband rather than be a wife to your husband, rather than managing him. So you've got to be careful about that because it's very natural for you to manage. You've got so many capabilities that you could handle 18, 20 kids, and that was not unusual throughout history that people had that many children. So when it says, your desire shall be to your husband, but he will rule over you, those same words are used in chapter 4. That was 3.16 of Genesis. 4.7 of Genesis. One chapter over, 
was where God was talking to Cain and he said, sin is lurking at your door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. And the point is, is that you, he had to overcome this desire to even kill his brother. And he says, you've got to be careful. And the words are the same exact words. It's like God says here, I just want you to understand what this desire is going to be. Now, in my biblical counseling courses in the past, my professors pointed me to some of this stuff. And they said, this is where the battle of the sexes was initiated. Before that, it was all natural. Everybody happy to stay in their lane. Everybody's glad with this. But now, the wife wanted to overthrow the husband, and the man wanted to overpower the wife. You see, it wasn't one-sided. It was both. Men could be harsh. And so sometimes you'll hear a message preached, and it'll say, wife, submit yourself to your husband. And a month or two later, your husband knows a scripture verse. He says, you're supposed to submit to me. And they throw that up, and they don't remember the love part, right? Well, you're supposed to love me. And so, as we get to those verses, we'll do that here in a minute more deliberately. But I want you to see this setting up. Aerial view, we're looking at Genesis. We're looking at a couple of people in between there and here in this passage before us. And I want you to see what it's saying in Ephesians. I want you to know you're supposed to be walking. And you're supposed to grow up. Grow up! Okay? That's what I need to do. In a generation like ours, it's kind of a necessary thing to say. When I say things were hostile at the outset here today, I said that advisedly. You see, you have sin in your members, in your body, in your heart. It's in you. You want to sin. Your mate wants to sin. Your world wants you to sin, and the devil is soliciting you every day to sin, and sometimes he can get people to solicit you to sin. It is dangerous out there. So don't look at your husband and say, he's got it easy, or look at your wife and think, she's got it easy. Nobody's got it easy if you're a believer, because now you're a target. This world system is arrayed against you. You need each other. And if you're going to have fulfillment in your marriage, it's going to be because you made up your mind to do it God's way. Because everything is arrayed against you. In fact, if you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, it actually talks about that when two are better than one and all that. But it also says, and even when you have that, the power is on the side of the oppressors to destroy that. That's why it's important to marry well. I don't mean money-wise. <laughs> I mean marry well spiritually. Because it will help facilitate your success. But what we're seeing now is we're seeing... In Ephesians, he's told you what he's really after. This calling is that in verse 13 of chapter 4, you would come to unity. He wants you to be unified in your faith. That means you give that your priority. I was asked recently, if you weren't pastoring, where would you go? I was trying to figure out how he would tell a friend of his to choose a church. I said, it'd be Baptist. I know doctrine in a Baptist church right away. I know what they're going to think. If it says free will Baptist, that's something else. Primitive Baptist, something else. There's different names. Southern Baptist means something else today. It used to be pretty solid, but now it's got to pick and choose. But my point is, it would be hard as a pastor to go to another church. But I've done that. I went from being a pastor to not being a pastor to being a pastor. I would get up at 5 a.m. and I would drive to Cleveland and I would work all day back in 2000 to 2007. I would work all day and then I would come home and I would go to church on Wednesday night. Was I tired? Ask my wife. But I was in church. It wasn't an option because I believed the Bible said go to church. I tithe because I believed the Bible said tithe. If you're going to have a fulfilling marriage, you're going to have to make some choices. You're not going to have it by equivocating and managing God, but rather letting God manage you. Do not ask God to let you be the smart one and let them be the dumb one or whatever in your marriage. No, neither of us know what to do. Look what's happening to Christendom. We've all made up our minds. We got this. We'll get back with you, God. We need to not be those people. It is God first. Always. It has to be. And I say it with intensity because I believe it. I don't just say it. I didn't get into the church pastoral 
position because it was my first choice. I thought I'd be an evangelist and travel, and that never happened. And so God put me in a pastoral role. But I was always in church, and when the doors were open, I was there. My wife was too. We were united. This is what we do. The church is open. We're going to church. Because we are the boots on the ground in this generation, if for no other reason. But there is another reason. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. It's being grown up. Now, I'm not saying go if you're witnessing to somebody. Witness to somebody. Go witness. Don't go to church if you can go win. (laughs) Okay? But if you're not winning somebody, if you're not occupied, like some of you come to me and say, Pastor, we we can't go. we got family coming in. There's a time that you have to be there for those folks, and you let them know you're not under law, you're under grace. You just love on them. Sometimes you'll be in a crowd and don't say, well, we should all stop and pray when they're all lost. Do you realize something? I'm going to let you in on a little hint. You don't have to pray over your food. You don't have to. No law here. When you're with them that are under the law, you live as under the law. When you're with them that are out from under the law, you live as out from under the law. You become all things to all men that you might be all means win some. I'm not setting up a a law saying you have to go to church. I'm saying God says you ought to go to church. Don't forsake it. So now I know what to do. In my calling, the doors are open. The Bible says we need to come to unity of the faith. And I'm drilling in on that. Your faith is a body of truth. It's a doctrine. Do you believe in tithing? Do you believe in church attendance? Do you believe in witnessing? Do you believe the economy could collapse? And I say that because that's where you're living right now. You may be looking at eggs and thinking this is crazy. They're making memes everywhere out on the inner space. You know, they're all around saying things. You know, you're just going to start smuggling eggs. You know, because it's going to be so rare. But my point is this, is have you made any adjustments in your life because you think maybe things might get a little dicey financially or whatever? Now, you're understanding if you have how belief affects behavior. So if you really believe Jesus is Lord, it will affect your behavior. If you have a body of faith, you do what the body of faith tells you to do. What does the Bible say? Did it change? Were all those other generations stupid because they just didn't understand as much as you and I do? No. They understood the same things we do. Obedience will help you have a fulfilled marriage. It'll be a unified. Two are better than one. If one falls down, the other, you know. I remember Janet, bless her heart. She had a husband who was in a lean place for a long time. He couldn't do much for himself, but Dan would get up and he would be up early on Sunday. And he'd say, we're going to church. You guys, many of you remember him getting rolled in here on a routine basis. She said, he'd be all ready. He'd be all ready. And that was two saying, let's do this. And she was ready to go too. She was lit up as much as he was. But he was up first because he had a little more to do (laughs) to get ready. And my point is, listen guys, this is not rocket science. Do the right thing and you'll feel better. (laughs) Okay, always. Just on any level, if you're getting a little under your skin, just go listen to the Bible. Let somebody tell you about Jesus more. You say, well, I can watch it on TV. Listen, it said, assemble, okay? That's beside the point because it's just about obedience. It's about heart. And the Bible says you're to come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Do you know what that means? That means we're supposed to... We are called the body of Christ. You remember Adam saw Eve... He saw her, he loved her, he was attracted to her. The relationship of Jesus is embodied in that whole beautiful scenario. And Jesus loves us like that. He loves us. He wants to be with us. All the time. My wife and I, we were apart for the bulk of our run into our marriage. And I had a cassette tape. I'd get on my tape and we'd talk and... We'd tell each other things. On My part was on one side and her part was on the other. I have that tape to this day. But it was fun. And I want you to know, you get to talk to your beloved on a phone if you're far away. Back in the day, it was letters for us. We sent tapes. We were poor. We couldn't use a long-distance phone call. That added up back in the day. But we're supposed to grow up into him. One man. What did he say? He said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. 
And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to the wife of his youth, and they too shall become one flesh. You're supposed to become an an entity, an emblem, and a unity. If you were to read ahead in chapter 5, he says, I speak a mystery, husbands and wives. I speak a mystery concerning Christ and His church. So you're supposed to grow up, and this is where you see it. Grow up into Him. He's your bridegroom, and you're His bride. Do you really like Him? (laughs) Do you like this person you're espoused to? And it's not just going to church. I I don't really want to make that a thing, because... I'm just going to show up. And if one does, I'm going to still bring whatever I prepared. It's the way it has to be. And it's the way of the history of the faith that it became more and more abandoned or desolate. You remember Josiah, right? You remember Josiah? What did he say? Go clean up the temple. Why? Because it was in disuse, in disrepair. What did they find? They found the Bible. Do you see something here? How many churches shut down over COVID? We're not the same since COVID. We want business as usual. We act like things are going to be business as usual. But God has taken Babylon down, folks. He's going to. So if it goes back, it would be highly surprising. But if it does, we found out last week what that would be about. Account the long-suffering of the Lord as salvation. But he says here, he says, till we all come to unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. That means as a couple... And as a church, as a couple and as a church, you should see God working in your life as a woman, and you should see God working in your life as a man. It ought to be happening. You ought to be able to come home and speak one to another about what God did this week or this day, or what did you get in your Bible reading? If you know they were just reading their Bible, what did you get? Ask them. It's a good time to ask them. You saw them reading their Bible. Maybe they don't read it every day. You don't have a law to read it every day, but in His law, you should meditate therein day and night. You have enough in there to meditate on but if you see him reading, what'd you get? Did you get anything interesting? I mean, you know, sometimes you got to churn a little milk to get some butter, and it might be, you didn't get any right there. I don't, I don't know, it was a little disjointed. I was reading in Leviticus, whatever. My point is, listen, this is how you stir up the spirit, your unity. You get this whole concept of unto a perfect man, knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man, you're in him. They two, one flesh. And the Bible says, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. You see that? The Greek word for followers is mimetai. We get the word mimic. You need to mimic God. Now, Jesus is God. He loves the church. So when he gets down here in a minute, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. You're supposed to be a mimic of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. Well, the son submitted himself to his father, so we understand submission. He laid aside all the prerogative of his deity, and he said, I do nothing of my own volition, but what I see the father doing, that is what I enter into. So we understand the idea of submission to people around us. Submit yourselves one to another means among the church, we need to get under each other and try to help each other survive, as it were. The Bible tells us in verse 1 that there are several things he wants us to do in our calling, and One of them is that he wants us to walk worthy of our vocation, which means to grow up unto that fullness of Christ. But now he's telling us he wants you to mimic God. It's interesting because you've all seen those impressionists. It used to be a bigger deal back in the day. You know, uh, what was his name? Rich Little used to be a big impressionist. And and sometimes people who are just actors have abilities that you don't hear about. And maybe they're on a talk show. You see them do impressions. But we should be like the church at Antioch. The Bible says they were called Christians in Antioch. It was letting us know that they were the little Christian ones. They're like little Christ-like ones, like you're an Ohioan. You're a Christian. Do they know that? By the way you behave, speak, and walk, as it were. Ephesians 5 says, followers of God mimic mimic him. The beauty of it is, is that follow and mimic makes sense when you understand we're the children of God. Because sons mimic their fathers. Daughters mimic their mothers. They make an impact. When we follow God, when we follow Him, we will naturally mimic Him if we really love Him. 
I remember back when things started getting off the rails a little bit, a little political cartoon, a little boy and arguing with his buddy, and he says, well, my dad's more fashionably rumpled than your dad. <laughs> used to be my dad could beat up your dad. Then it became about fashion. But the point is, my dad is more fashionably rumpled than your father. So they were making a point of our society as it was turning. This was years and years ago. Well, what we're seeing is he's telling us to mimic God, be followers of God as dear children. And so we want to follow God, right? And I've already made this point, but I'm going to drill into it a little bit. John 10.30 says this, I and my Father are one. They too shall be one. Understand? It was Del Faisenfeld who was a guy with life action, uh, but Ed Heinsohn at Liberty was uh, on his team, Life Action, when Jerry Falwell brought him into his team. Okay. And Del Faisenfeld used to make an analogy of how the Trinity is really a picture of the home. And he said that the Holy Spirit is like what the wife is in the home. She has a heart for the home. She puts up curtains. She makes it look pretty. She masks. She cooks. She makes everybody feel better. She is the comforter. In many ways. The husband's having a bad day. She says, kids, you go on out and play now. And she just runs block for him a little bit. Now, she needs to have this done for her sometimes, too. But the Holy Spirit was like the mother is in the home and the father is who he is. Then there's the son. Okay, so he can go out and prosper. So when it says, I and my father are one, you understand that there's a connected. If I'm going to follow God, I'm going to enter into this paradigm of the Godhead. Okay, that's what I want to do. I want to enter into that paradigm. And in Ephesians 5, 2, it says, Be followers of God as dear children and walk in love. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. A sacrifice, that means it's not easy. It's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. There's going to be tears. I mean, the first time... One of the children in the old days, and maybe in some families where we have a few in our church, that they have animals and they have to you know, process those animals. The children are baffled by the whole death thing of a lamb or a whatever. And that was always the case. Why do you do this? Well, when they gave sacrifices, that cute little lamb, especially on Passover was looked at for a week. They watched that thing for a week. Kids can get attached. But then they have to kill it. And that's a whole other conversation. And that's what you and I do. We sacrifice ourselves. It's a conversation we need to have. It's part of the body of our faith. The Bible says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, right? Romans 12.1. And so he says that you should do as Jesus did, who gave himself an offering and a sacrifice. And notice, this is said in verse 2. He's going to say it again now where he tells the husbands to love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. See, this is here, but it's everybody's job. But this is talking about all of our callings. And it says this, it says, as a sweet-smelling savor, verse 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Walk, walk, walk. That's the point. You know, walk worthy of the vocation. He said that in chapter 4, verse 1. Here he's saying, walk circumspectly. Circumspectly means looking around, looking at everything, taking everything in. 30,000 foot height range. What do you see? Do you see that Jesus could come at any moment? Do you see that people you know will go to heaven or hell? They are not going anywhere other than those two places. Do you see that? He would have us be walking circumspectly and caring for others and their impact from us. The Bible says, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, I like to take that and underscore the word redeeming the time, and I like to turn it around a little bit and to say, make the time redemptive. You see, you can spend a lot of time fishing and other things. Is it redemptive at all? Redeem the time. You only got so much of it. Right? And when you've got that time, what are you doing with that time? Is there a way to make it redemptive? Are you figuring out another way 
to reach somebody, or at least if you're fishing, you're thinking, how can I do this? Because you can be quiet. Men can really get out there, watch a fishing line, and figure things out. That happens. I get that because I'm a guy. But I don't fish, so I do other things. I might bump around fixing things or retweaking things. But um, Ephesians 5 to 31, look at this. It says, for, for this cause, and, I, and I, I think this is interesting. He says this later in the passage. We're supposed to be redeeming the time because the days are evil. I've already made that point. But then he says this in verse 31, he says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to the wife of his youth. They too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So am I making my point here a little bit? Christ, we're supposed to grow up into Him. What's your calling? You're supposed to become one with Him. You are part of the body of Christ. It says it in 1 Corinthians. It tells us that one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. Why? Because we're part of the body of Christ. If you're going to have a marital fulfillment, it's going to be because both individuals understand their roles as being part of the body of Christ, and they both are endeavoring to move in that direction together. When they do that together... They are going to enjoy expressing what God says. Listen, in Genesis chapter 1, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, just for a little bit of an aerial view of this verse, I read this and I'm thinking of three individuals coming and it's the Lord and two angels and they come by as Abraham's standing there in a tent door and he sees them and he realizes who they are. According to the passage, it's pretty obvious. But what does he do? He says, Sarah, go prepare food. She's got to go kill a critter. She's, she's got dominion too. She's wringing the neck of the chicken. She's slaying a, a calf or whatever she's going to feed them. It happens over and again. But the, the woman's doing it. So my point is, is that when I see have dominion over it all, she's running the farm a little bit up close while he's out plowing the field. And they're all working together because they've got the same agenda, and that's to survive. You may not feel like you need to survive today, but you do because the days are evil. You need each other to survive. You both need to be pulling the boat in the same direction. And that will give you great satisfaction if you will. If you don't, then you can find yourself kind of meandering, becoming discontent or you know, dissatisfied or not fulfilled. What I say, marital fulfillment is what we're talking about. But I want you to see this. He says, and God said, let us make man in our image. That word is masculine. Our image is masculine. Image. And after our likeness, Likeness is feminine. Interesting. Because we both bring something to the table when we think about God and who He is. Remember Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem and saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would have gathered you together. As a hen doth gathered her chicks, but you would not. So I would suggest to you what we can take from this. To me, it was very interesting in my study. God represents strength, but God also represents sensitivity. Now, women might be oversensitive and men might be overstrong, but if you're running in the same direction, we can learn from each other. And we become a picture of what the mystery is I referenced to you a moment ago in verse 31. A great mystery concerning Christ and His church. The Bible says submitting one to another. And for the wife, submitting means arranging herself under. It's uh, hupa tasso. Tasso was used in a military operation where you arrange the troops, and hupo means under. So you arrange yourself under. You dive for the bottom, and it's okay. You're not being humiliated. You're being completed. You're being fulfilled. You will do it well if you will do it. The devil would like to say, you're going to lose and you're going to be left out. No, this is not home yet. Okay, we just only do what we do. And the better we do it, the more we will find the blessing. It's very interesting when the Bible says in 1 Peter 3, Sarah honored her husband calling him Lord. And I remember thinking, where did she call him Lord? You know where she called him Lord? It's when Abraham was being told he'd have a son next year. And she said, shall I have pleasure of my Lord? that even possible? She was 90 years old. He was 100. She was calling him Lord in her older age because it took her that long to figure out what her lane was. 
It's not easy for a man to figure it out who he is or a woman to figure out who she is. It's all of us dealing with the things that are before us. But she's to arrange herself under, and it is a middle voice. She is not to be arranged, fellas. You do not arrange your wife under you. <laughs> okay, you, you let her take responsibility before the Lord to do that. But if we have the same faith, we will have no problem. You can't do it, and most men will not force such believing men. But if they're not believing men, they might be a little bit more abusive in certain circumstances. Be careful. But when I see it saying, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, I put this in my notes. Dance with the one that brung you. Okay? He married you. Dance with the one that brung you. It doesn't mean you have to submit to every man. Just to your husband. Arrange yourself under your husband. The Bible says this in Proverbs 30. It says, There are three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not. And this is Solomon. He says, The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon the rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Marriage starts out with the long walks on the beach, but then those things kind of fall off. They can't be consistently chased as if they are the object of your happiness. It's a problem with romance novels. When soap operas came in, it was always creating discontent among the masses, and then the family was impacted, being programmed to be discontent. But what really is true is that if you understand the 30,000-foot view of things, you will understand that nobody gets out alive, and what we can do to keep ourselves insulated and fulfilled is we can get on the same page with our husbands and our wives and we can begin to move forward for Jesus and see his hand in our lives and find the blessing and share that and rejoice over that as it comes. What I want you to see next is I want you to see it says love. So hers was middle voice, but his is active voice. It says, husbands, you must love your wives. The word love doesn't have really anything to do with emotion. If you will love your wives, you will get some emotion. But if you will not love your wife, you will wonder why you don't feel close to them anymore. Okay? So, but love is the Greek word agapao. It has the Christian twist to it. It means to make much of them. You make much of them. Because Jesus made much of you. You didn't deserve it. She may not deserve it. Right? The Bible actually says in this passage that she will be washed by the water of the Word, which means you need to use words. Tell her how much you're proud of her, how lovely she is today, how that new dress is really wonderful or whatever. Find ways to compliment because women need to be delighted in. But all of that being said, it's about making much of them because women feel everything. And so they need to be understood that this is a sinful world, and you need to understand that she's going to be affected by things you don't even understand she's being affected by, and you need to try to figure out a way to wash her by the water of the Word, that she might present herself to you without spot or blemish. God does that to us. Every time he says, I'll never let cast you out. Nothing can separate you from my love. Uh, you know, No man can pluck you out of my hand. After a while, you get down and you say, I'm resting right here. I'm good. I'm good because my bridegroom's got me. you got to get her to the place where she knows you got her. And then the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, I think it is, it says, Husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Giving honor unto the wife is unto the weaker vessel. Really, the word honor there means giving strength to her. He says, did your prayers be not hindered? Again, it's talking about you and she, she and you on the same page. When you are on the same page, you have the same goals. And your goal is, number one, to get your children saved. Number one goal, get your children saved. Don't teach them things are mamby-pamby about God, because God is clear about what He wants from you and me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, right? So don't let the kids wonder what that means. Show them. Talk about Him. Deuteronomy 6, when you go out in the morning, when you rise up, when you go down, when you go out, when you come in, talk about Him all the time. Because He's worthy of that. 
I've got to run through this. Love, it's a mysterious paradigm. Jesus washed us with the washing of His Word. We need to use our words. And He does this because why? Well, because He glories in the church. Did you remember this? 1 Corinthians 11.7 says this. The woman is the glory of the man. He glories in her. She's his glory. Ephesians says this in first uh, in chapter 3 and verse 14. It says, For this cause, Paul says, I bow my knee. And he prays several things. He says that God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened in the inner man. Number one. Number two, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Number three, that being rooted and grounded in love, which is what we're trying to get our wives to be in our love, let them know we really are about them, even if it's hard for us, as it is many times for them to be with us, submitted to us. It's hard for them sometimes, hard for us. The Bible says in verse 18 of chapter 3, and that you may be rooted in love and may be able to comprehend and to know the love of Christ. Now, if we're not going in the same direction, you really don't know the love of Christ. It's when you're really following Him, you know that love, personally, which passes knowledge, and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, listen to this. Now unto Him be glory in the church. Glory in the church. Wife is the glory of the man. Don't ever let go of your glory. Fight for the glory. Go back and get her, as it, as it were. If she's crying in the corner, go back and sit there with her and cry too. All I'm saying is we've got to fix this. We're the head. Let's not let them suffer silently. They're your wife. They're your glory. And if they're suffering, you're diminished as well. So do what you can to unburden them if they're overburdened. As I said before, these are very important things to the fulfillment that comes from marriage, God, as God would have it. Turn over to Ephes or Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I'm going to wind it down with this because I want you to see what this looks like. Ecclesiastes 9 says this, and I'm going to be taking some of these verses from the New King James because there's a couple of verbiages here that are hard to get the other way quickly. It says, likewise, uh, it says this, it says, For I considered, and this is Solomon speaking, he says, I considered all this in my heart so that I could declare it all. I wanted to understand man's life. He says that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. Did you hear that? The righteous and the wise and uh, the righteous and the wise and their works are in God's hand. You guys see the 30,000 foot view. You're in God's hand if you're the righteous because God saved you. He imputed to you righteousness. The righteous and the wisdom that you have, if you have any at all, God gives it from His Word. You don't get wisdom in the world. You can get the world's wisdom, but you can't get God's wisdom. The righteous and the wise and their works are in God's hand. Think about that. So what's God going to do with you? What's He going to do with you? The Bible says in verse... Four, it says, actually between three and four, and two, three, and four, it's saying one event happens, everybody's going to die, everybody knows they're going to die, and he says, so this is what you need to take from that. He says, but for him that is joined to the, all the living, there's still hope. A, a living dog is better than a dead lion. He's making the point that if you've got a neighbor, you and your wife have a neighbor, you and your husband have a neighbor, they're lost. They're a living, lost person. And they're better than a dead lost person, he's saying. He says, for the living, uh, for he that is joined to all the living, there is hope. There's still hope for them. And he's got your works. He's got your righteousness and he's got your, your, your wisdom. He's got it in his hands. He wants to use it for the living next door person who's lost. The living dead person, <laughs> let's put it that way. He says, but for him that is joined to all the living, there's hope for the living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward. For the memory of them is forgotten, and also their love and their hatred. 
I don't know if you caught this in verse 1, but it says the, the works and all that are in his hand. People neither know love nor hatred by anything they see before them. He says, I've looked at everything. This is chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes. You're going to see nothing but misery out there. If you're not in the, the, the age we're in where we have so many things that kind of distract our misery. But in those days, they had a lot of misery. He says, nobody finds love and hatred by looking at everything they see. You can't really figure out what's what. But... The righteous and the wise and their works are in his hands. And he says, they won't find it out there. It says, in their love and their hatred, it'll perish. Their envy will perish. This is all in verse 6 of chapter 9. He says, go, therefore. Go. And he says, eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already accepted your works. Did you see that works? He brought it right back in. He's saying, you're the one who's next to the person who's lost who will die and will perish if somebody doesn't help them find wisdom and find love that God alone has. He says, go, and he says, eat, drink. He says, for God has already accepted your works. Let your garments always be white. Have a good testimony. And let your head lack no oil, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit in front of your neighbor. Let your garments always be white. Let your head lack no oil. Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. <laughs> it's almost like a backhanded thought. He says all the days of your vain... He's not saying your life is vain. He's just saying this part of your life is the vain part. This is the part that's kind of rough. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. But he's saying you've got a wife there. She's your companion. Now, when it says live joyfully, the Hebrew word is ra'ah. It means to see with your wife, to see, to look at, to inspect, to perceive, to consider. Consider that neighbor. Together, consider. Live joyfully, meaning that you have white garments, meaning that you're enjoying the food, drink God's given you, and you are doing it together. That's the joyful part, but it means to see with her exactly what God wants you to see. He says, live joyfully with the wife of your youth, or with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life, which he has given you under the sun, all your days of vanity. He's given her to you all your days of vanity, for this is your portion. Sounds like calling. This is your vocation. This is your calling in life and in the labor which you perform under the sun. I don't know if I've strung this together well. But for me, I want you to see the 30,000 foot view. Your life is about getting on the same page, growing up into Jesus, walking in behind your father, being mimics of God, understanding the mystery that he talked about. He says, husbands, love your wives. Wives, see that you respect your husbands. He says, listen, all that to say, I'm talking about a mystery here that is one of the singular mysteries of the New Testament. Every sacrifice in the Old Testament was a mystery. But one of the singular mysteries in the New Testament is you and your wife, you and your husband, getting on the same page and picturing what Christ and his relationship with the church is. He can't wait to get us home. Do you remember when you got married? Do you remember walking down the aisle? Do you remember seeing her for the first time that day? Do you remember being shocked that she showed up? <laughs> she didn't run. Listen, Jesus is worthy of that kind of glory from His church. Let's be His. Well, how do I do that, Pastor? You do that by being a good married couple who love Jesus together on the same page in unity with the same goal, knowing that everything you've learned and are learning is something you can invest in your ability to go out there and discharge your calling in a manner that brings other people around too. Would you bow with me for a moment? Well, that concludes today's portion of the message. This has been a ministry of Faith Baptist Church in Ontario, Ohio. And I'm Pastor Dave Davenport. I hope you'll join us Monday through Friday for our verse-by-verse -verse studies. And we hope you'll tell others to tune in as well. If you'd like to contact us and learn more about our ministry, go to faithbaptist1.net. You can also download recent broadcasts on our homepage. We hope you'll make it a point to tune in daily as we go to the Word. <laughs>